right, coaches. Welcome to Speed Kills Football. We have a great guest for y'all today, Coach Ben McLaughlin, OC at uh, Alexandria Senior High, uh, the 2020 Louisiana 5A State runner-ups. Uh, coach played his college ball at Louisiana College. After that, he uh, moved on into coaching, became the offensive coordinator at Northeast Oklahoma A&M, and then uh, he went back to Louisiana College to become the offensive coordinator over there. Uh, everywhere Coach has been, his offenses have been pretty efficient and explosive. And he's going to share a little bit of what they do with us today. So without further ado, Coach, you can go ahead and kick us off. I uh, can't thank you enough for, for contacting me and let me come on here. You know, first and foremost, guys, uh, um, nothing that we do, at, whether it was at NEO or LC or here at Ash, I mean, there's – you know, it's not about plays. It's about, you know, uh, toughness, and it's about making sure you coach your schemes uh, to where your players do the plays better than other teams do their plays. It's a pretty simple deal. So uh, I hope you're not here looking for these awesome, ingenious RPOs or pass concepts or run concepts that are going to be no better, just going to work every time. Put this on your play call sheet and call it when you need a first down. I don't have any of those. Uh, but I, what I want to talk about is I really kind of want to approach – RPOs and simplifying RPOs is what I'm going to eventually get down to, but I really feel like it's necessary that I kind of go back because at LC, we weren't simple in our RPOs. We ran every single RPO you can think of, and we did it from every formation. I mean, we, you know, it was a great recruiting tool because I would tell all of our receivers, hey, every single play, you could get the football quarterback every single play you could throw the football you know uh it was um and then tell running backs hey running backs because of that i'm going to call running plays 80 percent of the time uh so it was a really cool recruiting tool but when it comes down to it it's a lot harder in practice to do some of that stuff um even though sometimes it can seem like it's a really simple concept so i'm going to kind of go back and kind of explain how i think about rpos and when it would when i think of an rpo kind of how we built it back then, and then why I changed and why we changed it and how we simplified it for this year and uh, and how I feel like it worked for us and it may be even better. So what we did, what I did back then, if you're here, if you're listening to this and you RPO every single play, we got a lot of good yards and we scored a lot of points doing that. And if you're here, though, because you're trying to just dabble into it, and you you haven't trusted it, and you don't know if you know if RPO is something you want to get into, and you're on that side of it. Depending, no matter what side are you on, I want to kind of show you where we came from, and then where we are now, and the pros and cons to both, and so you can figure out kind of when you approach it, when you put one in, or you get to decide how much you want to do one, or which ones you want to do. Some questions you've got to ask yourself before you get into that process, because it's not about plays, it's about can your players understand what you're asking them to do and, and then go out there and perform it. So if you're logging on here late or if you're watching this late, this first few slides is not simplifying RPOs. These are just in my brain RPOs as a whole. So the pros, okay? This is why we all wanna run RPOs right here. This is the very, very generic. You wanna have multiple answers in a single play call. You don't want any check with me's or audibles. You got a play call in, no matter what the defense gives you, the quarterback should be it, can do something that gets you in a good spot without any further need for you to look at the sideline. You can play faster, all that good stuff. A good quarterback, and I probably should have put a great quarterback, can make you right. You don't have to have the perfect play call on RPOs. In theory, and I say in theory, a good quarterback is going to be able to get a take a mediocre or a bad play call and turn it into a average or a good play call the cons we all know them if you're here it may be because you ran these cons and you're about ready to throw the rpos out and you're just trying maybe one or two last speakers to try to see if they can maybe talk you back into it i don't know if i can do that but here's the cons we all know them the quarterback must understand the structure of the defense and the run fits in addition to the coverages so not only does he have to know what cover one is what cover two is what what three you know three poach what cover five is what all the stuff that you need him to learn from a past side well now you've got to go and talk him through okay these are our unblocked guys if we get in this personnel package and they get in this specific defense and we run this specific plays these are the guys that are unblocked oh but now they change defenses this changes oh we're down to there's so many things that go into that that the quarterback's got to be able to know if you want to really go all in on rpos and do a lot of them as post snap rpos 
um, you've got to be okay with, and I put it in parentheses for a joke here, but you know, it's, it's with high school with high school players like most of us uh, have. They're teenagers. They're 15, 16 year olds. You've got to be okay if you're going to go jump into the deep end with RPOs, and you've got to be in theory okay with a 15 year old calling the play. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, that's not something that a lot of people are, are comfortable with. My new boss here, Coach Bachman, awesome. He's not comfortable with that. That's why I had to go sit down and kind of re uh, reevaluate what I was going to ask our quarterbacks to do because I know he's not big into that. He doesn't want that. And he made a good point. And it's oversimplification, but it's a great point. We get paid salaries to make calls in specific parts in a game. The quarterbacks, those players, they don't. So why are we always asking them to make the run of the pass decision when we're the ones that are being paid to make those calls? And it's an oversimplification, but it's a really good point. And so um, I'm going to try to tell you when we do get to simplifying it of how you can take some of those decision making out of the quarterback's hands, still keep some of the mo uh, of the good stuff in there, but we can make it a little bit easier and, and make it a little bit easier for your head coach. If you're here as an offensive coordinator, uh, their head coach kind of swallowed the fact of it's OK, we're putting this in, but it's OK because you're going to put the quarterback in the perfect spot so he can never be wrong. If I say something, if I feel free to yell, you know, Coach Shore, you or anybody else listening, y'all can hit, yell at me. You have a question. I'm good. I'm a fast talker, so I'm gonna I'm gonna roll on. But you're not hurting my feelings. If anybody wants to stop me, if I say anything, or if you have a question about anything that I say, so okay. Traditional RPO categories. In my mind, there's four main ones. There's pre. There's two pre snaps, two post snaps. You have a pre snap leverage or a grass based RPO. This is a quarterback looks out there at the RPO. He yes knows it based off the pre snap leverage or the open grass, depending on how you want to term it. Okay. It's a yes, no. If it's a no, we run the ball. If it's a yes, we throw the ball pre snap. you got a pre snap numbers base. This is the kind of where it all started in my opinion. Back when I was a, you know, my first really the year after I stopped playing, we really started at LC as when I was kind of GA and we started getting into some of these and it was started out being numbers based count the box. All right. If we're in 10 personnel and they've got six in the box, we got to throw it. If we're in 10 personnel and they've got five in the box, we're going to run it. That was kind of the very first evolution of it. But anyway, so you could have a pre snap numbers based count the box. You could have a post snap triple option. This is the zone read dart. I've got an unblocked backside five tech. And if he squeezes, the quarterback can pull it. But now instead of just pull and run off the backside of zone or the backside of a tackle pull, you know, gaps, team play, whatever you do, whatever you want to run, well, you can pull it, attack, and then we triple option the second level defender after the quarterback has pulled the ball. But that is a run play that he pulls because of the first level defender or the five tech or the four tech or the nine tech, whoever that backside defensive end. That's a post snap triple option RPO. Stop, then, stop, stop, stop. Yeah. Yep. Say again. Oh, I got you. All right. Post snap, second and third level movement keys. All right. That is post snap after the ball snap. Ball's in the gut of the running back. And we're looking at second level or third level defenders, linebackers, safeties, maybe a corner. And we're looking for movement keys. So if he comes in the run, I pull it to, to, to rip the pass. If he wants to flat foot or stay back, then we run the football. Hey. And they're, they're, uh. That's their plus one defender. Yeah. That uh, that will that's going to be in the run game, and we're going to keep them off so that we can run the ball. Or if he wants to be in a plus one, then we're going to attack him in the pass game. That's kind of the four different RPO categories in my mind that you have, and in those you can run a horizontal or a vertical RPO. So you can obviously horizontally we can stretch their conflict defender or the defense horizontally with with bubble screens, fast screens, hitches, out slants, whatever you want. Or you can have a vertical RPO, a glance, a seam, a dump, any of those more. Or vertical, obviously, attacking routes. You're trying to make somebody come up so you can go over the top of them, or vice versa. You want him to defend the vertical route so that we can run in behind him uh, and remove their extra defender. Okay, so these are just, uh, I'm going to give you kind of our context, how we teach these after this. This is still, again, I'm just giving you an example in my mind of the different categories. So this is a pre-snap leverage-based RPO. We're playing a line right here. We're at 10 personnel, three by one set. The third defender right here is the safety. He's deep and he's inside, so we've got him leveraged on both. Quarterback pre-snaps it. It's a pre-snap RPO. We're running a GT counter but we get the throw right here because of the defensive leverage. 
the, the most basic, simplest RPOs. This would be a pre-snap leveraged or grass-based RPO, and it is a horizontal RPO because we're stretching the defense, obviously, horizontally. Okay? He made that decision pre-snap. Now, we are running GT here. So if he didn't like it pre-snap, he would be using this as a triple option and would be reading this guy. But it was a pre-snap throw, so he doesn't. He can catch grip and rip it. Same thing right here. Pre-snap, fast RPO. Forgive me. I know if you guys are a lot like us, we fight the cameraman a lot. <laughs> so we got a bit of a blimp. But we have three receivers to the right. We're throwing a fast screen to number one off of an outside zone run play up here. Pre-snap, he, we like the leverage based off who their third, where their third defender was. It's just grass. We like the grass. We take it. We throw it, and we get. We get obviously, if they all work like this, it'd be it'd be nice. They don't all work like that, but it's a good game. <laughs> So those are pre-snap horizontal RPOs, all right? Let's talk about post-snap. Now, I'm, I put this in here because this is how we taught it at LC, and I'm going to say that a little bit over the next few slides. Uh, for those of you that are wanting some of these post-snaps, I, I wanted to make sure these were in here because they're good stuff. We didn't do them this year. We did a couple of them. Not a, We didn't major in this. It was a very, very small minor, all right? Uh, it was a very small part of our RPO game plan this year. But at LC, this was a huge part of it. And so you can get very good plays. So these RPOs are the toughest to master, but they can have the ability to be the most explosive. These have to – you have to limit these to one or two types so the quarterback can be very familiar and confident. You can't run a whole bunch of these because – you. The, the, the quarterback has to know the structure of the defense from a run perspective, which is why I think uh, these are so awesome because of that. You win the marker war here. All of these are the ones that you can put on the board and you win because you got answers no matter what the defensive player does on the board. It becomes a lot harder when he actually tries to read this in a game. All right. You got to teach us off twitch movements. I think if you're going to do post snap movements, you got to. It's got to be very simple. A twitch, a step. It's not a well. If he comes in two steps, if he comes up two yards, you can't put a distance on it. You can't put a, a steps on it. It's got to be either it's a twitch or it's not a twitch. You got to keep this very simple for your quarterbacks. These can be quick game RPOs. They can be vertical RPOs when reading second, third level defenders. I put this last point in bold. Because we didn't run these at Ash, we still ran them. We just didn't run them as RPOs. Every one of these uh, vertical RPOs, if, you, if you're a head coach or if you are not comfortable in letting the quarterback make these decisions, these can be easily substituted with play action passes, and you get the exact same thing. So I know that seems like it's really 1980s, but understand, uh, you know, if our play action passes – our vertical RPOs came from play action passes, okay? So if you're not familiar, these are the hardest to read. If you don't want to get that in the quarterback's hands, do what we did, and you can make these vertical ones um, play action passes, and I'll show you a few of those clips at the end, okay? Um, so here's a couple of – this. these first couple are triple options. So we're in a trip snub set. We're running GT to the left here. So we have guard tackle pull. We're running a fast screen here. The quarterback's reading the end here. This is Halt, and they're playing some kind of a version of a slide defense. This guy might have been a five. He might have been a four eye. So we pull, and he squeezes, and they do what we call playing behind the zone. If you're a big zone team, you know what I'm talking about, where the end squeezes, makes the quarterback pull, but it's the inside linebacker that wraps around the quarterback's not reading him. He's reading the end. The quarterback pulls it, and he gets hit in the mouth by the inside linebacker. So Halton's doing this on our GT counter. We're not a big inside zone team, but we are a big uh, counter GT, counter power team. So he plays behind the zone. Quarterback pulls it because that's the correct read post snap. And then he throws the triple option. Again, this is nothing special. I'm sure you guys are watching this. You probably uh, played with this a little bit. But again, that's just an example of a post snap. You can see it from this angle. It, it looks like he is more of a four tech, maybe a five tech. Pulls it, plays behind the zone, takes the triple option. Okay. Here's one at LC. We did run this this year as a post snap, but we, I didn't get a good one on film. So we're running basically right here a, in, a, a regular inside zone. We did run a lot of that at LC. Our fullback has the flat. It's a first level triple option RPO. So here's his read key, and then here's his triple option key. So the quarterback pulls it because of the squeeze. He attacks. The outside linebacker goes wide, so then the quarterback runs it for seven, eight yards. 
post snap triple option RPO using a fullback flat right there. Our receivers are blocking like bubble. This is stats in our Division One opponent. So the the last year, so that was a true freshman quarterback. You'll see. All right, so here is a post snap vertical RPO. We're running, I believe this one right here is outside zone lock. So we are locking the backside five tech. We are running outside zone on the front side. And the, and the read here is the strong safety. Stetson ran a lot of one high man. Whether I think they did it all the time, but they're probably thinking we're D1, you're D3. We're going to lock you up in man coverage and we're going to win. And they won. But this is so it was playing more of a loose man right here. But the read here was this guy who was their strong safety that in this set would walk down. So this was a pre-snap. The quarterback knew what he was going to do. The safety's down, so he pulls and throws the glance RPO. So this is not a play action this year. Now, this year for Ash, we ran this as a play action, but this is a true outside zone for us. But pre-snap, the quarterback knew. But if this was post-snap, let's say this safety was right here on the snap. If he triggers down, well, then it would be a pull. But this was a lot easier. You'll find on these a lot of times – pre-snap where they line up. Not a lot of people, even at at our level at LC, at, at the small college football level, not a lot of people did a lot of post-snap movement. It was usually a good pre-snap. So anyways, that is a pre-snap second level defender, really third level defender, but he's down post-snap vertical RPO. We got a lot more film at the end. I'm going to try to get all the way through the slides. The, and then, um, and then I'll show you a little bit. Here's a post snap slant RPO off of an inside run. He's reading the backside. We're right here. He's looking at that backside Sam linebacker. If he triggers horizontally, then we're coming back on the backside. Again, these are hard. You're seeing all these from LC because we did not do these at, at Ash, and I don't think you have to. But I just put these in there for examples of post-snap vertical RPOs where you're reading second and third level defenders. I got some more at the end as well. All right, so I pulled a couple of pages from the playbook that I made at LC to show you the complications to running RPOs on every single play or on a high percentage of your plays. If you see, this is two pages of the playbook, so I just copied and pasted them and put them on one slide. All the triangles were the guys the quarterbacks needed to read on post-snap RPOs. And if you look, all right, so this is – it's 20 personnel versus even front, you know, versus even versus odd versus bare 21. All of these are a bunch of different personnel packages against a bunch of different defenses. And the quarterback had to know where all the triangles were. All right. This is why I got away from this this year, because I did not. The, the time at high school is so much more limited when you the, with players you have even in small college and small college the time's limited to division one college and I'm sure that time's even more limited than what the guys have at the NFL so uh, we just the juice wasn't worth the squeeze to me to teach the quarterback all of this different I mean this is just one play against multiple defenses and multiple personnel packages I don't think it's worth it it wasn't worth it for us doesn't mean it's not for you so I just put these in here because I want you to see all the triangles. And at LC, this is what our quarterback had to learn. If I gave him any concept, any uh, formation, and any defense, he had to go and tell me who their conflict defender was, who the plus one defender was, so that I knew that he knew who we were going to be RPOing. And then when you get to these outside runs, look at some of this stuff. There's three freaking triangles on this. That means – Anytime we could RPO any of those three, I won the board. I've just beat every defensive coordinator in America on the board. But now in a game, how is that, you know, he's got to be able to know which one we're going after. How does the run affect it? There's just so much stuff there that in practice probably – is it worth it to you? It's going to be up to you. For us, it wasn't. So this is the complicated RPO. Uh, again, buck sweep, pin and pull stuff, kind of like outside zone. Again, I love it at, uh, because you can RPO the front side or the back side. You can keep them both in and have the quarterback having yes, no on the front side, yes, no on the back side kind of thing. You can do all kinds of stuff. If you want to talk to me more about these and what we did, because we got some, we got a lot of good stuff out of this at LC. I'll be more than willing that you can hit me up and we can talk about them. But 
This is what I threw out. I threw out all of these complications because here's the issue. Defensive adjustments. If you get really good at LC, this is what defense did against us at LC because we ran RPOs on about almost every single run play. Their two main adjustments are this. The first one's man coverage. If you're killing them with RPOs, they're going to go man and they're going to get a plus one in the box. And they're going to say, can you beat us in man? The good thing at LC was three of the four years I was there. Great. I'm good with that. Play man on those two guys, and we're going to go throw them deep balls, and we're going to get a lot of yards and score a lot of points. And we did. My last year there, we had some really good receivers, but they, we didn't have the ability. that that Those 70, 30, 60, 40 balls in our favor became 30, 70, 50, 50 at most. And so now I'm thinking, okay, I'm about to go to Ash. They're a hard, they're a run first, power run football team that plays defense and wins games. If I let the defense – for tell me what we're going to do and we're throwing go balls, you know, every, you know, two or three out of every five plays, I'm going to get fired before I get out of the scrimmage. So I knew I couldn't do this because I can't let the defense tell me what we're going to run. We got, we had to make sure we would attack it from the other side. So the first way is man coverage. If you've got a bunch of dudes at receivers, by all means, don't let this scare you. Go beat them against man coverage and you're going to score. If you don't have those dudes and you're big into RPOs and they jump in man coverage, well, then they kind of got you right there because now they're going to get their plus one and they're going to take away some of those RPO throws. The other way they could do it is they can adjust the conflict defender. So now, as opposed to the outside linebackers, the force, well, now the outside linebacker is going to be pass first and they're going to bring the force from the safety or they're going to bring the force from a trap corner. I don't know if y'all know. We got this when this got big about two years ago where people started playing trap into the boundary where the corner became the boundary run defender and the safety was spinning over the top. That really hurt our boundary RPO game because we've never had an RPO where we're having to RPO the low run defender corner. And so now you've got to not only do you got to know your RPOs, you know, your base RPOs against the base defenses. Well, now you've got to prepare, at least in your mind, for all of these different defensive adjustments. And bottom line is, if you put all your eggs in the RPO back, basket right here okay if you can't beat man coverage or you can't adjust and your quarterback understand the different conflict defenders you're going to be stuck and you're not going to be and you're going to be stuck with no good play calls and your head coach is going to be mad at you so here was a uh, inside zone uh, zone lock where the backside inside backer was going to be the RPO guy but we're in 10 personnel so he's the extra we've got fast screens ran they're playing man press up here so I was okay with the go ball this was a good receiver that was really good man to man so that was a run play that became a touchdown because this year because hey they're gonna they're gonna Plus one defender. They got one more in the box. We got to throw it. Oh, they're taking away our fast screen. Throw it deep. I was okay with this because of personnel. Some years, you're not going to have that guy. And so if they're going to walk up and play man, you got no play. This year wasn't. Here was Bellhaven. We knew they were going to play a lot of man because of the RPO game. A lot of people played man because of this. And so now we had an RPO game to where he knew who the unblocked backside inside linebacker was. And if he's in the box, we're throwing it. And I just had a pick play called over here. So, so I had a man beater route with a uh, in their RPO. So he saw it. He knew it wasn't a run. He pulled it and he, we threw our little pick play. They end up switching it off and we get a play right there. So those were different ways that defenses try to take something away that if you're going to be heavy into these RPOs, you got to be able to combat. Here we go. So this one, ETBU, this one I was saying, it was weird. They try to take it away, the boundary RPO by their backside safety by robbing number three and poaching it and now playing man, a traditional coverage. But this guy, this backer right here, the normally, if I was going to say, who do you think their field run defender is, everybody would start this guy. Well, no, it's not that guy. He's going to play pass to take away that RPO. So the run defender here, the guy that was to defend the RPO actually was the backside safety. And the first time we ran this, he did his job and he covered his receiver. And we got numbers now on the front side of the run, which was the boundary, on a pin and pull scheme. It was a good play for us. Next next play, we, we tempoed it, same play, same same everything. Y'all ready? If it works once, run it again. Same play. Now the backside safety who just got gashed because he probably left his uh his run his run responsibility too soon to cover. He comes down, now we're able to pull and pop and throw the, the vertical RPO. So what I put this, what I'm saying there is understand the quarterback has to be able to see that. 
He's got to be able to know where the plus one is on a week-to-week -week basis. Sometimes the defenses change it up on a drive-to-drive -drive basis, and that can be very hard. Here was that glance RPO, safety's back, so we hand the football off. But if we got trapped corner, I didn't get a good one on this, but let's say he came down and wanted to trap this. Well, the quarterback now has to understand, no, 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 it's not a safety read. It's a corner read now because of a trap corner, and he's got to know what to do off of that. So, again, I'm just telling you these are the reasons why I decided to simplify. Here was the last thing I'll talk about before I get into what we do. I know I'm getting down to about 15 minutes right now. So I want to hammer in that is RPOs in a nutshell. And this is what we did to simplify it. Here's two unintended consequences. In our RPO game at LC, we had autos. Every single run, the receivers had an auto. If it's one receiver, they ran a grass. Two receivers, they run a fast screen. Three receivers, they ran a fast to number two. What happened was they got conditioned to not be physical. They got so used to, we're got a run play, I got an auto, oh, I know I'm not gonna get the ball right here. So first off, they don't run a very fast uh, screen. And secondly, you're going to need them to block somebody sometime this year. On a big third and two, you're gonna need to condense your split and go dig out a linebacker. And if you don't do that, but once a game, he ain't gonna get it, all right? He's not gonna do it. So I realized after the fact, once I came to Ash looking back, I conditioned my receivers to be soft because I didn't, we approached it from they ran routes every time. And so when I needed him to block, we tagged it. We would call a play and I'd tell him to block because I had to, because if I didn't tell him to block, he ran his auto. They weren't very good at it. Not because they weren't good players, because I, the mindset from that receiver was, we're a finesse, we're an RPO team. I'm not gonna go dig out that backer. And I think, in my opinion, the best way is to reverse that. You've got to be able to block every single play and then call the screen when you want it. So then in their mind, oh, we're blocking, we're blocking, we're blocking. Oh, now coach gave me a chance to catch a ball. Now the excitement is a little bit more there and they'll screen game. The other thing, the running backs. All right. I didn't realize this, but if the we had two years where we were the, the, the top – two passing offenses in our conference and the bottom two rushing offenses. And I had a young gunslinging quarterback and he was confident. And anytime we called an RPO in his mind, I knew it. He didn't have to say it. He said, we're not going to gain two yards on this. I'm a really good quarterback. I'm just going to rip the ball right here. I'm going to throw it every time. Okay. And so over time, and we're pulling the ball 60, 65%. Well, the running backs get conditioned to that quarterback's going to pull the ball. So now it's not what's my read key. I got to hit the hole hard. Well, what is it's, is he going to give me the ball? That's the first question the running back's head. And if that's the first question the running back says, is he really locked into doing what he's, when he does get the ball, is he 100 miles an hour hitting his read key? Looking back, we weren't. And that hurt us because when we did need to run the ball on some of these and the quarterback did give him the ball, it was almost like half the time he was surprised or he was trying to figure out what to do once he got the ball. Now, understand, that's my problem. That's me being a bad coach. If you do this and you coach it up correctly and you don't fall into those traps, you may be fine. But for me, looking back, those were some unintended consequences. So here it is. All right. This is all of that. I know that's 25 minutes of uh, a lot of stuff that I wanted to get to this. When I took the job at Ash, I had to, you know, we, we I sat down with these couple questions because, you know, if you get hired on as an offensive coordinator, in my mind, their coach, a head coach is going to hire you for two reasons. He either wants your scheme and he says, I'm hiring you because I'm, your plays you're running, come here and run those plays with me. I need your plays and come with it. And that's great. If that, if you got, if you're an OC and that's what the coach hired you to do, awesome. All right. Or the other way is, no, I'm hiring you because you're a really good coach and you're going to bring something to the table and you're going to add to what we already have built here. And that's the position I was in. Ash won a lot of football games before I got here. If I left today, they'd win a lot more after I leave. They didn't need my plays to win. They just he thought I could bring something to the table. So I knew that I had to build the offense from uh, based off the identity that he wanted. All right. And the, what I was doing at LC is not the identity that Coach Bachman wants for his team. But I knew there was some really good explosive plays. If I could bring some of it over and simplify it, that it was going to be good for us. So here's the three questions in my mind that everybody needs to ask before you put this stuff in. Why do you need to implement RPOs? What's the purpose? Are you trying to you have something that's working against you? You're trying to fix. Are you trying to improve your run game? You're trying to improve your pass game. Why are you doing it? What percent of your offense do you want to be RPOs? All right, just just 
obviously spitballing this 20%, 50%, whatever you want. How reliant do you want to be on the quarterback's decision making in the RPO game plan? On third and two on a game winning drive, are you going to be okay calling an RPO and letting him make the decision? If the answer is yes, great. If the answer is no, then you need to know that when you put these in so that you make sure you'd only call these plays in the situations, obviously, where you're good with them. All right. So, Here's the here's where I think once you figure out the, your you know what you want your purpose to be you got to figure out your truth. So the truth is what do you want the quarterback to do that he's never going to be wrong? Okay, in this RPO you're never wrong if you run it. In this RPO you're never wrong if you throw it. You can have different truths. We didn't. We had one truth at Ash. It was you're never wrong in throwing the ball. I don't care if you are good. You're never wrong in throwing the ball on every RPO. I know that sounds crazy, but it works, okay? It worked for us. So for us, we wanted to – this is the reason why we want, I wanted to put RPOs at Ash because I knew we were going to run the football. And so I knew our games were going to be shorter, and so we needed to be able to – uh, we had to eliminate dead quick game throws. We were going to run the ball with success. I wanted to limit, if there was five plays a game, everybody has them. You called hitches because they've been open and all of a sudden they come down and press it. So you call hitch, they press, most everybody, okay, convert that hitch to a go route. So now instead of calling a play that's supposed to get you five yards, you're throwing a 40 yard go route. That's not what you intended when you sent that play in. You wanted a, a definite four or five yards. So this gave us, if they took away our quick game, we eliminated the dead play by now running the football. 24% of our calls and games within three scores were RPOs. Of that 24%, okay, I want to say about uh, 11 or 10 to 11 percent where the quarterback actually threw the ball and of those 10 or 11 percent we threw 29 29 plays this in this in our nine game season we threw the ball and we completed 27 of them we only threw two incomplete passes in the way we did our rpos and this is why the main advantage of it here and i'm gonna get i'm, I'm running out of time the 90 10 rule the quarterback when he came up on an rpo he looked out there and i said is there a 90 percent chance you can complete this because if it is i want you to throw it every single time if it's not if you have any doubt and that thing is below 90 percent run the ball we're a good running football team if he got if we got two yards on an RPO, that meant the quarterback had some confusion, something he didn't love, and I would take two yards over throwing it over his head for an incompletion, taking a sack, or worse, forcing it into an interception. So this gave him the confidence in the advantages right here. It gave him the confidence. I knew if he threw the ball, it's because he saw pre-snap, he loved it. Because if he didn't love it, he knew he could just give the ball to the running back and they were good. So the quarterback told them, the running backs, any time that he wanted to hand the ball off, he told them. We had a code word, and that told them. So the running back knew, um, or the running back knew, excuse me, he told him when he was going to throw it. So if the running back didn't hear anything, this is my ball. It's my rock. I'm about to get this ball, and I'm going to go bust it for a 20-yard gain. So he was geared up for the run. If the quarterback saw that he liked the throw, he gave him a code tag. The, the running back knows, oh, I'm just flash faking 100 miles an hour now, and the quarterback's going to throw it. So I knew every time the quarterback pulled the ball, on those 29 plays, we completed 27 of them because he knew it was a completion before he even snapped the ball. And that's what I needed to do, eliminate dead plays off quick games. It allowed me to call more pass plays. I, could, I moved from a 70-30 for what they were the year before to a 60-40 run to pass team because I knew that some of those percentage of run of passes were going to be runs if he wasn't sure about what he did. I was able to negate both those unintended consequences. So we've got about six minutes here. I'm going to go super fast through these. Get with me later. I can share you. I can talk later if you want more. So this was a shift. We shifted to empty. And the quarterback's job here, the RPO is, he's throwing the screen. They came up, he didn't love it, run the ball. Obviously, this was a 70-yard gain, but I don't care if their quarterback runs a 5-2. If he doesn't love the fast screen, don't waste a dead play by throwing it over his head. Let's go. If he gets tackled right here for four yards, I'm good. Second and six, let's go. And if you got a guy that can do that, obviously it's going to be good for you. I'm going to go super fast right here. Here you go. Fast screen to number two at the bottom. We're running GT. They're playing man-to-man -man coverage. The quarterback does not love the fast screen because they're playing man-to-man, -man, so he gives it to him. 
if you don't do them and you call a fast screen and you throw this, you're, if you get two yards right here, it's probably a good play. But because of the RPO, the, the quarterback, he doesn't love it, hand the ball off. A, a running back makes a really good play, and we get a big run. I know I'm going fast here at the end, but I want you to understand, here's the simplification of it. you got to start from a point. And if you want to start from every you're, – you're never wrong in passing it, then you only call these RPOs in a quick game or screen scenario. Because if you, if you only – I'm never going to get upset if he throws an incompletion because I'm only calling this when I would normally be okay with just a quick game throw. All of these, he doesn't love it. He hands the ball off. Let me get to some. Let me get to some throws here. All right. So here you go. These are fast screens. He loves it. He takes it. It's just, he's not counting the box. He's not trying to figure out movement. He's not looking for a twitch from an outside linebacker. It's a simple question. Is there a ninety percent chance you can complete this ball? And if the answer is yes, he throws it. And if it's an incomplete pass, I only called that in a situation to where I'm okay with an incomplete pass. It's his job to throw it. And then if he's if there's any if there's one ounce of not being confident, if that number drops below 90%, run the ball because you know what? We're a really good running football team. And if we run for two yards and it's second and eight, that's better than second 10 by throwing it over his head because he didn't, because they pressed a hitch or throw an incomplete pass. I'm going to skip a lot of these here. I got, a, I got a lot of these. That was just a bubble. Here's your triple option. We saw one of these. Here's another one. He pulls it, throws it. Don't get a lot of good yards out of it. Not a great throw, but get tackled there. But a, a good op look there of, again, that's two-yard gain. We're staying ahead of the chains. Triple option. He pulls it. A little under a minute, Coach. Yep. Uh, let me get to – and at the end of the day, what you can end up doing, guys, is you put your entire quick game into these hitches, outs. So you call hitches, and with a run play, if you got it, you take it. Right here, look, they confused him, so we ran the football. That was some, I call. I wanted to throw hitches there. He didn't like what the defense gave him. He ran the ball, eight-yard gain. Later on, same exact play, same exact everything. He liked it now, so we get our we get our completion. At the end of the day, guys, it's all about, and I've got a bunch more clips. I got some vertical RPOs from LC. It's all about making sure the quarterback's super confident. And if you call a situation, you never put him in a position where he's wrong. So again, 94% completion percentage we were on RPOs this year. And what you're gonna do here, all right. Your, what your purpose and what are your truths are. So our purpose was we wanted to eliminate throws. We did not – we wanted to take away any opportunity that we could have called – I could have called a quick game and the defense could do something that took it away and it became a dead play. We wanted – I wanted an out from those plays, which is the opposite of what a lot of people like RPOs because they want to eliminate dead run plays. We're a running offense. You know, we're – Put one extra guy in the box. We're going to run the ball. That's what we do. So I approach it from the other way, and I think it makes it, it takes a lot more pressure off the quarterback because in his mind he knows, okay, I don't have to make the the offensive coordinator right by making the right call. I think it's uh it, it works it worked better for us. I told you about talked about our percentages there. I just want to you know, when the quarterback throws it in the way we called RPOs this year, this this year. He was a thousand percent confident because not only did he like the call, but he, he could have had an out and he didn't take it because he liked the call. He liked the quick game. He liked the screen. He liked the out, whatever it was. It took that pressure off of him for making the right decision. Um, and again, the, the advantage of this, and I, I, I glanced over this, but I wanted this one right here. All right. What I didn't realize I did, but you know, the games are a lot shorter at, at the high school level. You obviously, based off time, but now we're a running offense. We're playing West Monroe and Ruston. We're playing a bunch of running offenses. That, I mean, if you get 45, 50 plays in a game, that's a, that's a, that's a good play. That's a lot of plays sometimes. And so if, 
four, if I called four quick game plays and they were wasted, man, that's 10% of our offense were just, I could have told you before he snapped it, that was going to be a bad play because they jumped down and took something away that I didn't think they were going to do. So this allowed me to call more of those knowing that if they did do take away this quick game, I'm not just throwing a low percentage go ball, converting a hitch. I'm not having the quarterback trying to scramble out. He doesn't, you, you've all seen it. Your, your quarterback's about to snap. You can tell, oh crap, he doesn't know what he's looking at right now. He doesn't like it. So he takes it, he shuffles back, and he looks to run because he didn't like it pre-snap. Those plays now became run plays for us. And so um, that's why I like doing it this way. Were there any other slides that you wanted me to skip through you wanted me to go back over before I get a little bit more into some of our other plays? I think I'm good with the slides, Coach. Uh, okay. Get some tape going. Okay, so yeah, and, and you mentioned earlier before we started recording again. Yeah, we like fast screens because two reasons. I think it's an easier throw for the quarterback. If the quarterback throws it behind the fast screen, he can take one step to his back, catch it, and still get vertical. A bubble screen, you bet throw it behind him, it's probably a dead play. And plus, the, the fast screen can peripheral vision feel the defense. So we can catch it and step underneath blocks a lot better. Those bubble screens are pretty blind to it. So we run a lot more fast than we run bubbles. I do like bubbles from the backfield, from a running back position. Um, a, a bunch of those runs, I just want I just put these in here because I just wanted you to see, hey, you know, we had a fast screen called. I called this play because I wanted to throw a fast screen. Oh, they took the fast screen away. The quarterback doesn't love it. It's a check down. And the handoff becomes a check down. And now – if it's one of these plays where it's a first level RPO or, or a triple option, he doesn't like it pre-snap, it can still be a post-snap triple option. He could have pulled, if the backside in here didn't squeak, didn't, didn't stay square, he could pull it, attack this defender, and then run that off triple option as well. So those plays obviously have a little bit of a double-edged sword to them. Um, let me get to the, I, I got you a lot of fast screens. That's easy to see. Where I kind of left off was, some of the quick game stuff now. Yeah. So sorry for our blimp. So this is just all hitches here. And you could even simplify it even more. I actually called just one hitch. So this guy is still trying to dig this backer out. He's still trying to push crack on the safety. And I've got one hitch being ran. So the quarterback knows I'm never upset with him if he throws this hitch. Now, obviously, you've got to teach him when the hitch is open and when it's not, but it's it comes from the perspective of is the hitch open, not if how many numbers are in the box, not what is where is the weight of the force defender. He goes inside or is outside. It's none of that. It's as simple as is the hitch good. If you like it, he throws it with confidence. It's a good play. He tells the running back right here, I'm throwing it. So the running back now, it's not that half fake, oh, is he getting – no, no. He knows. The quarterback told me I'm out of there with a, a – so he makes a better fake. Everything's everything's a lot smoother and faster because the quarterback – the running back knows before he snap it on 90% of these whether he's getting it or he's not. And I think that mindset of the running back makes it, makes it good. I mean, these are obviously really simple – just a hitch. Here's the hitch up top, playing fast. So here we actually had two of them. Had a hitch and a fast screen off a little stack set right here. So, you know, he could look either side. He didn't like his fast. He liked his hitch. If he didn't like his hitch, he would have ran the football and it probably would have been a big game. That's kind of what we did that year I was telling you about, Coach. Yeah. Single receiver was automatic hitch, and then we had some type of fast or bubble to the 20. Yeah. Like I said, at LC, this was autos. So at LC, I could call this run play, and I, it's all I did was call the run play, and the receivers had their automatic RPOs. Again, I, I know I went really fast because it was closing down. I really think if you want your receivers to be good blockers, you can't do that because it's about – you're, I'm now asking you to block. I'm asking you to do something tough. Oh, crap, I got to go block now, as opposed to I think I'm never going to go back. I'm not going to have autos anymore. I want you to block. You get it in your brain. Blocking is this play. Oh, I'm now I'm now tagging a hitch. So, yes, it may be an extra tag, but I really think the mindset of the receiver, it's, it, 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 was, it was every bit of the difference because our receivers at LC, it's not they couldn't block. I just conditioned them not to block because of all the autos that I put in. I don't think I'm ever going to go back. I think I like it this way. So here again, the, the defense was moving. We were playing with tempo right here. He was any type of confusion, he handed the ball off. 
So again, you might can debate with me. That's not a true RPO. These are sure fine, but in theory, that quarterback it, maybe it's a PRO. It's a pass with a run option if you don't like it. Maybe if, if that's if that works better for you. I just know that two incomplete passes. Uh, one of them was a drop, and one of them, the quarterback skipped a hitch. I mean, he, it was just a bad throw. Was, but of, of 29 plays, if you tell me I'm throwing quick game or I'm throwing screens and you're completing 95% of them, you would take those percentages. And I, and I really think it's all about the quarterback being super confident that he knows I'm throwing this, because, like right here. He wasn't confident here. You know, I don't know, if, is this guy going to take away the hitch? You know, is is he going to – I don't know. I'm going to run the ball. We had a quarterback run scheme in there. So, you, so you're trying to call your RPOs, Coach, whenever you would – you're basically replacing your quick game with the RPOs, correct? Yes, and not all of them. We still called some basic quick game that I didn't – whether for protection purposes or we still – I mean, so we called – Again, 77 or 70 ish RPOs when the game was within reach. All right. That's kind of, I did that because I mean, once, once we got out ahead, we didn't call as many of them. But yes, I called them in situations that I was calling quick game, but I, if I packed it, call it quick game in. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So that, that is my approach. Again, that's super simple. And somebody, if you're still listening to this and you're 40, you know, 50 minutes in, well, that's a, that's a really – I'm just telling you from a guy that went – we RPO'd every single thing. I just – this was a lot better. And the quarterback played with a lot more confidence. And I had less meeting room where I'm like, no, no, you're wrong because look at the look at the weight distribution or look at the depth. That safety's at six yards. No, no, now he's at nine yards. Well, if it's at six – it, it just became it, – it can get really convoluted. You can do some of those, but if you want to do them, in my opinion – and I'll get – let me get to a couple of them here at the end. If you do them, you've got to do – you've got to make them very few, and so you can rep them all five or ten times in a practice, those few simple RPOs. So here's, here's one. Here are some post snaps. Did, did you want to see any more pre snaps that we had at? Um, I think I'm good on the pre's, coach. I think I got you on those with the bubbles and the yep. fast and the quick. It, it's mainly bubbles, bubbles, fast screens, quick outs, plays that he can look and yes, no pre snap with not he's a throw. So this is one that we did as a post snap. It's a front side power RPO where we're really RPOing the front side force defender. We had a grass backside. He didn't like it because of this drop linebacker. Sometimes he rushed, sometimes he dropped. So that backer flinched in, he pulled it and threw the out. So that's a very simple post snap RPO that you can do. Obviously, it's, it's only really good versus cover four teams or cover three teams. If they're playing some type of trap or cover two, the corner is an issue. So you've got to be careful. And all of these, there's, there's asterisks. You've got to be careful because the defense, I mean, it just, there's a lot more in the game planning, in my opinion. Like right here, I, I put this one in here. This is a zero yard game. But you know what? The way I was teaching this uh, three years ago, I guess now, he's the quarterback's right. This is that same play. We are same side. Here is his RPO right here off of a quick out. So I was teaching him movement of this guy. Well, what does he do on the snap? On the snap, he shuffles back. The read there is to give the football. But if you're running RPOs to be better in the run game, you know what? You got to be able to block them six versus six. If you can't block them six versus six, RPOs aren't going to help you because you're all you're trying to do with RPO is to keep it from being six versus seven. So, you know, at the end of the day, the quarterback was right. If I had to put this in now, he probably looked at it. He probably would have looked out there and said, oh, I've got soft corner, cover four. Look at the linebacker. He's out leveraged by three yards. I'm just going to take this pre-snap. So if I'd have used this year, he would have thrown that and we would have got a lot bigger play off of the way we taught it at Ash this year as opposed to the way I taught it at LC as a post-snap RPO. So, I mean, you can see, hey, we got everything we want, but it didn't work. Just because the quarterback reads a post-snap right doesn't mean the run's going to be open. You still got to block them six versus six. So this was a transfer that came to us from a Division One school in Texas. Super smart, really good player. And this, you know, we're running the buck sweep to the left. We are pulling both guards, and we are running a quick out right here 
and we're re RPOing the outside force defender. If he's high or if he comes in for the run, we bang the out. If he chases the out, we hand the ball off because we got numbers. He's just guessing. <laughs> he's just guessing. He, got, he gets lucky and he, his feet get him out of it. But there was, I mean, this lets me know this is hard. This is a hard read. It's a split second read. You don't have to be a great quarterback to coach quarterbacks. I fortunate was enough. I played. So I have a little bit of knowledge of what it's like in there. I've never ran an RPO, so I can't even teach him from firsthand knowledge myself how to read, read this RPO. It looks good on the board, but this lets me know, man, it's just a guessing game. If that quarterback's going to guess, I would rather me be guessing than let him be the one that's guessing out there half the time. So when they work, they're great. But at the end of the day, I found out that most of the time when we hit these vertical RPOs, I was calling them because I wanted him to throw it. I wanted I called a vertical RPO. If he hand the ball off for a three-yard gain, my gut was a little bit disappointed because, man, I really thought we could bust an RPO. Well, if that's my thinking, just call the dadgum play-action pass, you know? You know, so this is just we're faking a little ISO. We knew their plus one defender was coming from the safety. He was the read. He's down. We pull and we pop the, the, the fullback off a little ISO look. So, you know what? I guarantee you if I'd have asked our quarterback here, he said he was he knew pre-snap he was going to throw this football. If that if he's already going to make them pre-snap, then they need to be pre-snap reads. I don't think most of the time I just found looking back, the, the quarterbacks were making their decisions before the snap. If that's the case, I need to build it around that. Here's a bunch of these glances. I love these. These are good football plays, and they're good off play action. If you want to do them as an RPO, they're good. These are the front side glances. We had it where we could run the front side glance, and we could run the back side slant. So if they took away the front side glance pre-snap or we didn't like it, then he could read the back side of it for flow. So he was reading the backside right there, and we get a good play off of a – I think that was – Oh, that was what you're reading, the play side high safety? Yeah, yes. Now, they were man defense. So going into this, we knew that if you like the front side, it's because you like it versus man. In theory, against the zone defense, it's if they're going to play one high, they need to have a low outside defender. They didn't, so we knew the run was always going to be good to the boundary here because they didn't have an extra guy there because they were playing man over their trip side receivers. So he was looking at the back side to see if we got a free slant on this one. He could have done front side or back side, but he made that decision. That's a lot of stuff that you're giving the quarterback. And I did it at LC for marginal success. It helped us. At LC, we were really good at throwing. We weren't very good at running the football. So I think the RPO helped us in the pass game. It did not help us in the run game, which is why I didn't want to take that to Ash where they're crushing the run game. I don't want to bring something in that's going to now make a running back be hesitant. I, I want to make our RPOs needed to help our pass game. That's where it all came from. Right here, glance on the bottom. The camera gets off here. But the safety down here at the bottom is coming down. Quarterback pulls it and throws the glance window right there. Not a good job, our camera people. Uh, right here, same thing. So here's Sol Ross. So they Sol Ross did a really good job of mixing up too high and then rolling to one. Or in this case, we were playing with tempo, so they were lining up in it. So the quarterback saw the safety down. He knew there's a really good chance I'm throwing this glance. The safety stayed down. He pulled it and he threw the glance right there. So that is a post-snap. Again, I, we did not do this at Ash. We ran this play, but I called it from an RPO look. I mean, I called it, excuse me, from a play-action look. So we still ran these, just not as a true RPO. So I believe I got a couple of these this game. Here we are again. Now look at the safety. He's back. You got to be careful for trap. This guy could be a run fitter. They didn't do it, so the quarterback wasn't worried about it. But against defenses that they can't – the safety can be back and they can trap the corner here. So that's why you really got to be aware of where that conflict defender is. Safety's back. Uh, it was a nice, easy read on the handoff. So it's a good little series. It's a really good concept. A lot of people – this is a vertical RPO. We still got our backside slant up here. If they took it away at the bottom – 
So right here, actually the quarterback, what he was probably doing, since the safety's high, we don't like this front side much at all. He's probably looking at this backer for the backside RPO on it. But again, it's just a lot of options right there. So post snap, one of your favorite post snaps you could say is the glance coach. Yeah, no doubt. The, the post snap glance RPO, if you're running outside zone or buck sweep, is really good because a lot of people have to fit that boundary run with the safety. And so you can really get – um, a lot of good looks right there. And I know a lot of people are post snap reading that up uh, the backside linebacker. So you're yep. on the power right. Uh, what you think about that one? Yep. See, in this one, we got both of them. So that's what I was saying. So right here, if the quarterback, if they have a deep safety, if they're playing cover four, the glance is not good. So what I, what I, what I taught the quarterback at LC was this is not good at all. So don't post snap it. Let's post snap the backside. We got a slant with a glance on the backside here. So here he's looking at the backside and he decided to hand the ball off. The, the backer kind of, so we do, he, that, that play is in. Also the leverage from this guy takes it away. So we, tr I tried that, I mean, they'll say we did a lot of that where we had a front side and a backside on our outside run plays to give him that front side glance or that backside slant. Yes. Hey coach, um, you want to go back to some bubbles and some of those fast screens and kind of talk about uh, the receivers blocking rules? Yes, I can. Uh, I will, let me show you one more. Here's a glance to number two as a post snap read that, that force defender. Let me go. Uh, there's a stutter. So then if you're going to use a lot of those, this was a this was still an RPO with a glance stutter. So they, they take away a lot of those glances. Then you got to hit them with a the stutter. So we missed this one, but it was a good look at it. All right. So you want to go back and, and see some of those fast screens fast screens and maybe some bubbles and just talk about the receiver blocking rules on those. Yeah. Um, to keep things as simple as possible. All right. And, and at, at Ash, you know, the good thing was on our fast, we didn't get a lot of variance, you know, even our, the really good teams, they do what they do and they're, they're not trying to fool you by switching up the defensive yeah, coverage. Yeah, they yeah. were trying to be, they we're going to do what we do better than you do what you do. So, um, when we were doing that, let me get to a couple of, so, you know, we would have one or two rules on our fast screens and it's all depending on the leverage of, of, of number two right here. Okay. If, if number – what we wanted to do here on a normal fast screen is number two would get the corner and number three will get number two and we'll run away from number three. That's our base rule, okay? Number three's job was if he felt he does not have good leverage on number two, then he would make a call and it would cause them to fold it. And that just means we're switching this, and now number two is going to stay on number two, and number three is going to wrap for the corner, and they're going to switch responsibilities. So we going into the week, we knew basically which one we were going to do. But in theory, there was a call that if they lined up and did something different, they can call that. But we would want to call the fold on. All right, so if, we, if nobody talks, it's normal there, there, and there. Obviously, that's not a good one. Look right there. We're calling fast to number two. But that's if you're doing fast to number one. Yeah, I got you, Coach. See if I can – I can. I did have one. I think it was earlier. I did it on the early one right here just to show you that look again. So, here, Halton, or I think this might have been Slidell. We liked it here anyways. Even though he wasn't out leveraged, it was just a good look so it because makes the home call right there, so to speak, and they fold. Yep, that's okay. all it is, and so we it just helps us out on our angles. Okay. On the bubble, it'd be the same way. Again, we don't run a lot of traditional bubbles by number three, but it would be the same way. You know, normally number two blocks. Uh, number two, number one would block number one in a traditional bubble sense. But if number two gets out leveraged and, and he feels nervous at all that I don't know if I can reach that guy, then he would call for the fold and that would become a crack 
and a fold around. Same concept, obviously different plays with different people, but whoever has the block on number two for us makes that decision. If he feels like, oh, I got that guy, well, then go get that guy. But at any point, oh, no, I'm, I'm nervous here. I may be out of position. If it's a bubble, he can call the fold from his number one receiver, or if it's a fast to number one, then, uh, then number three can call the fold to the number two receiver so they can fold it that way. It works from out of the backfield too. I think I might have had one. We did a we didn't do a lot of bubbles from the receiver. We did a lot of bubbles from speaking the back. of this, coach. Do you let's say hypothetically, do you like the traditional bubble or do you like where the uh, the receiver who's running the bubble turns his back and faces the quarterback? No, because I if we run a bubble, we're going to run it traditionally because I think what makes a bubble really good is the ability to catch it with speed. Yes, sir. Um, now, if if your slots are your best receivers, you know I would if you run the bubble where he crawfishes or he turns his butt and he backpedals. In my opinion, what you're trying to do is you're trying to throw a fast screen to the number two receiver. Because he's not getting momentum, which is totally fine. If you if your number one receiver is not the, the screen guy and is number two, and you're having trouble throwing the, tr the accuracy on the traditional bubble, by all means go to that. But we we switched our receivers up. We flopped them in and out a lot. So if I wanted to throw our slot a fast screen, well, we would formation him as number one, and no big deal because we do that a lot anyways. If you don't do that. So I would say, you know, in a perfect case scenario, a traditional bubble where you're throwing him with speed, so you're running away from the unblocked inside guys. But if you, if you're if you have a hard time with that, the the crawfish bubble is an easier throw, but you lose a little bit from not gaining that momentum. Perfect. Perfect. You want to go into that halfback bubble or running back bubble a little bit? Yeah, I, I was getting into it. We. Um, we did a lot of – I cannot – we did a lot of quick, fast motions from, from that field. Uh, I'm having a hard time finding it right here. Where did I put that? Oh, right here. So this was huge. You know, we, we molded – and and we molded it. We're a 2011, 21 personnel team. And so I will say this, if you're, if you're still with this and you're a 10, 10 personnel only team, the way I'm doing it's going to, it's a lot easier to get outnumbered and have a free hitter in a 10 personnel scheme because they can go six in the box and have a run through. So for us, if we got outnumbered by the box like this, it's because of this guy on our run to the left. And good luck. If this backside, if the third linebacker in the box can come all the way through all the trash and make a play, good on you. So I wasn't worried about six for, or seven versus eight. Fine. You know, as long as we got in the front side. But I, I could see where spread teams may have be a little bit more nervous about the box count because it's a lot easier to beat six versus five than to beat eight versus seven. Um, so we did this a lot. I use this motion a lot in quick game and in the RPO game because you, you got a lot of people would react to this. We would, we would run just basic, you know, you know, run a seam, run a slant, and run the flare screen, and this is not an RPO. This is just normal because we did so much of this in the quarterback run game, and we did so much of this in our quick game that right here what he's looking at is, okay, when we fast motion this guy, you know, we, we've got two over two. So if, if we fast motion and nobody adjusts, we've got numbers three over two. We're throwing the bubble right now and we're rolling. If anybody adjusts, if you see any movement and it makes you nervous at all on the, once we send him in motion, you run the football. So boom, obviously, now look at our box. We're, we're quarterback run game. This is a 21 – we have two tight ends in right here. So we get a 21 personnel run play against a six-man box. So we have five – we have seven versus six now. So not only do we get it back to normal, but with this RPO screen, we've got – we gain the advantage of a plus one. That's why I like the flare. If you've got a quarterback that runs, run the, run the RPO bubble screen. Nobody adjusts. 
throw your back. It's just a running back swing screen. We all run them. Oh, somebody does adjust or there's any kind of confusion, run your run play. If you've got a running quarterback, you just gained a hat. So that might have been the only one, but we did this a whole lot. And the more you do that, the more you can now run all your quick game. We just, you know, we, we ran a lot of stuff off of that quick motion. And if you're a team that likes to be in 20 personnel, well, you can now get in two back split backs. And now you can run one quick and still get a running. If you don't have a running quarterback, you can still get the run game out of an 11 personnel look starting out in 21 and then motioning to 11. Here was a 10 personnel bubble. So again, if I could, if I was teaching them the way I'm teaching them now, he would have saw a little look where I call it the hard, they're deep, deep, they're above the hard deck. They're, they're a man-to-man -man team, and they didn't chase. When we went motion, they would go down and back. And so if I was teaching this now, I would be teaching, you know, pre-snap, okay, motion. Oh, they're coming from the backside? Throw the bubble right now. Make him attack this. I didn't. I was teaching this as a, as a true only tr uh, triple option, and he decided to give the football, and it was a good game. We got good yardage, but that could have been another way we could have got a, a receiver in space off of a um, off of an RPO as opposed to making it tr a triple option look. Same thing right here. Probably could have just pulled and threw that and got good yards here with speed, but it was a triple option look for us. So we he wasn't he wasn't looking for that, which is why one of the reasons why we switched to it. You know, another thing is. You know, I don't think I made this point. I may um, one of the one of the things I do every every time we put this in. Let's see if I can get it here. Gain loss. This is a short gain. All right. I, I like to show the quarterbacks this play. All right. This is an RPO. We're running a dart play here. We're running dart for us. Uh, pulling the tackle, arcing the end, and we're running a fast screen out here. I said, okay, here's an RPO. The trick question is, did the quarterback make the wrong decision? And most of the quarterbacks that we have, they're going to say yes. Yeah, you only get – he caught it and got tackled, you know, for a three-, four-yard gain. And so what I want them to understand is, no, the quarterback is never wrong here. I called a fast screen. If he throws it for a zero-yard gain, he did not make the wrong decision. Look at this. Second and seven. He threw it, and we got four yards. Third and three, we're good. Ash football, we're a running football. You give us third and three, we're, you're, we're, we are – the entire playbook is in. These RPOs, they, the quarterback can't be thinking, I'm getting the big play. I'm going looking for the big play. No, no, no. If you if you can complete the ball, throw it. If he catches it and get two yards, you know what? We're second and eight. That's okay. That isn't. You're, you don't overthink this. Don't try to find the big play. It's very simple. Can you throw and catch it? If you can, take it. If there's anything that makes you nervous, run the football. I think I went through just about all of them. Is there any other thing? that I, I, I breeze through or do you think questions that somebody else might have? Um, I don't think so, Coach. Um, I think you hit everything that we talked about. I'm going through my – I guess if, if, you, if you told me to, to, to tee all, you know, too long, didn't read it, find – if you want to get in RPOs and you're nervous about them or your head coach is nervous about them, you just – this put the quarterback in a position where he's never, ever wrong. No matter how you do that, if it's run, you're always good. Find a way to do that, and only call them in down and distances where you're okay with either decision. That's where you start. The more you trust him, maybe the more you can add to his plate. But in my mind, if you really want a simple RPOs, put him in position down and distance and RPO wise where he's never wrong. He'll build confidence. He'll throw the ball with with with, with more conviction when he runs the ball. The running backs will have it, and I think you'll have a lot better success going that way and then build from there however you want to go. All right, Coach, we thank you for uh, coming on. And uh, Coach will be back with us on uh, March 7th with Coach uh, Furtada from uh, 
Catholic of Baton Rouge, their head coach, and St. James's head coach, Coach Valdez. And we're going to be talking about the run game out of the gun, I believe. Coach, is that right? Yes, sir. So that's March 7th, and the time is uh, to be determined. Uh, if you check out the Speed Kill page, uh, you'll see all that whenever more information is available. Uh, so other than that, guys, thanks for tuning in.